My name is Dilesh Bale. I'm an active Microsoft Valuable Professional or MVP. I blog at handsonarchitect.com and my Twitter handle is at the rate Nilesh Bale. As part of this video series, I plan to talk about auto scaling containers with Ada on Azure Kubernetes service. I assume that you have prior knowledge of what Docker containers are, what Kubernetes is, and in general, how Microsoft Azure works. So let's get started and see what's on the agenda. In part one of this series, which is today, we are going to have a quick overview of the application that I've been using for these demos. We also look at the setup and verify the development environment that is required if you were to create a similar project on your own. We will provision the Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS cluster. In part two, we will extend this and install RabbitMQ on the AKS cluster. We will package the .NET Core application into Docker containers. We will publish those images to Docker Hub container registry and deploy the application onto the AKS cluster. And then in part three, we look at Keda architecture, install Keda on the AKS cluster and use the auto scaling features provided by Keda. So let's understand what the application would look like. It's a .NET Core application which has a producer which produces a set of messages, in this case, 1000 messages and publishes them onto a RabbitMQ. And there is a .NET Core consumer which picks up these messages and processes them. So this is done in a batch of 10 messages. The source code for this particular application is available in my GitHub repo. So you can go to Nilesh Kole, PD Tech Fest 2019, and all the source code for this demo is available here. Let's get back to the presentation. Let's start with the prerequisites. First of all, we need to have a Microsoft Azure subscription. As part of my MVP benefits, I already have a Azure subscription. But in case you don't have one, you can visit this page, azure.microsoft.com, and you can start free. You get $200 worth of credit, and 12 months of services can be utilized within that credit limit. There are also some services which are free, which are always free, and you can know more about those services here on this page. Next on the list of prerequisites is a Docker Hub account. Docker Hub is used for storing the container images. I say this is optional because if you don't want to create your own Docker Hub account, you can use the images which I have published under my container registry in Docker Hub. This is Nilesh Kule slash the name of the image. So we will be using TechTox Consumer and TechTox API images throughout this demo. Next is the code editor. I prefer Visual Studio Code, but you can use any editor of your choice. It could be Visual Studio or something like Notepad++ or uh, any other uh, editor of your preference. So if you don't have Visual Studio Code, you can visit this page and download it for Windows or Mac. Next then we need Docker Desktop. Docker Desktop is the application which is used to containerize the application on the desktop. This is also a cross-platform tool and it can be installed on Windows or Mac. We will use this to create our container images and to push it to the Docker Hub registry. Then we need PowerShell. PowerShell is used for scripting and automation. PowerShell is also cross-platform now and it runs on Mac, Windows, and uh, Linux. So you can use this page and you can get started if you need to set up and install the PowerShell. Next, we need the Kubernetes CLI, or kubectl or kubectl as many people like to call it. kubectl we will use as the command line interface to interact with our Kubernetes cluster. 
you'll use it to see the monitor state of the objects which are deployed on Kubernetes cluster and to perform various operations. Next, we need Azure CLI. Azure CLI is also a cross-platform command line interface to manage the Azure resources. So this page helps you to get started with Azure CLI. Next, we will use Help. Help is a package manager for Kubernetes applications. And if the application is quite complex and has multiple dependencies, it can be packaged using Help and you can deploy it in a seamless manner with the help of Helm command line. So we will be using this to deploy Keda as well as RapidMQ onto our AKS cluster. We also need a terminal. My personal choice is a Fluent terminal. Uh, you can use any terminal of your choice. Uh, if you are using Visual Studio Code, it has an integrated terminal. You can use the normal command prompt or you can use uh, the Windows terminal, which is one of the most recent terminals on Windows. And last but not the least, we will be using Postman. Postman is a utility which allows you to call APIs. So in our application that we are using, there is no user interface. It has an API and in order to invoke that API, we will be using Postman. So once we have all these tools, we will start with the Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, let's look at what are some of the features of Azure Kubernetes service. AKS is a managed instance of Kubernetes running on Azure. It gives various features like access, security, and monitoring. For identity and security management, it integrates very well with Azure Active Directory or AID. For logging and monitoring purposes, it has integration with Azure Monitor and Azure Log Analytics. From a cluster point of view, it allows cluster node and pod scaling. Cluster nodes can be upgraded using the command line tools as well as the UI. It has support for GPU enabled nodes to support compute uh, intensive workloads such as machine learning and AI. It supports storage and volume support. So we can use Azure Managed Disk and Azure Files with the persistent volume claims to store data outside of the AKS cluster. It supports virtual networks and ingress. So if you have a virtual network existing within our subscription, AKS cluster can be deployed within that virtual network and it supports HTTP application routing. From a developer point of view or developer productivity point of view, there is Azure Dev Spaces, which allows for creating CI-CD pipelines and to integrate seamlessly with the developer workflow. AKS also supports Docker images and private container registry. We can have our images deployed into the Azure Container Registry and we can use that private container registry instead of the Docker Hub public registry. AKS is CNCF certified and many of the regulatory compliances like SOC, ISO, PCI DSS and HIPAA certifications are also available for Azure. This and many more information can be found at the link provided below. So let's start with the demo of provisioning the AKS cluster. Before we start provisioning the cluster, I would like to go to the command shell and verify that we have all the resources available or all the prerequisites available. So let's start with Visual Studio Code. So I can check Visual Studio using the code command and like many other command line tools, I can say code help you can see that Visual Studio Code 1.43.2 version is installed on my machine. And here are all the list of command line tools or uh, command line commands that it supports. Next, let's verify we have Docker installed. So I can do the same, Docker help. And this shows list of options for Docker. We can verify what version of Docker we have by running docker version command and I have 19.03.8 version. 
we can also verify that Docker desktop is installed on my machine by going to the settings and this will show me what are the options which are currently set for the Docker desktop. So here we can see under the Kubernetes tab or Kubernetes plate the option to enable Kubernetes version 1.15.5 to start with the Docker desktop when it starts. This will start a single node Kubernetes cluster when the machine starts. Then there are the options for resources which are allocated to this particular instance. So I have three CPUs allocated, four GB of RAM and one GB of SPAC. SPAC if I can say that correctly. So this gives us the option to customize the Docker desktop environment. Next on the list is the kubectl. So let's verify that we have the kubectl or kubectl installed on my machine. kubectl, you can see version and the syntax is slightly different here instead of hyphen hyphen version is version and client client version so i have version 1.18 of the kubectl here next let's verify that we have the correct version of PowerShell installed so for this we use one of the environment variables which comes with PowerShell yes version and this will show us which is the PowerShell version and which is the CLR version against which this is built. So I have 5.1 version of PowerShell installed. Next, let's verify that we have the AZ command line or AZ CLI. So let's use AZ help. So AZ is like a top level or a group command and it has multiple sub commands under it. So here you can see the group is AZ and the subgroup is account ACR, uh, AKS, uh, app config. So these are all the services and we use AZ and then the respective service to interact with it. So let's say I want to find out uh, what is the accounts that I have or what are the subscriptions that I have. So I can use this AZ account subcommand and say AZ account and list all the accounts that I have or all the subscriptions and you can see here that I've got two subscriptions linked to my email ID and one of them is Microsoft Azure uh, sponsorship the other one is Visual Studio Enterprise Then we can also see some of the commands specific to Kubernetes service itself. So uh, this comes with AZ AKS and let's say help. So this will give us all the commands which the AZ AKS command is supporting. So you can see there are browse commands, create, delete for enabling add-ons, disabling add-ons, versions. So let's start with understanding which versions of Kubernetes are supported. So AZ AKS get versions. And here we see that uh, this requires a location parameter to be passed, which is a mandatory argument. So let's see uh, what versions of Kubernetes are supported in the location Southeast Asia which is Singapore should be get versions so there are multiple versions supported and this comes out at the, as a JSON output. We can specify the output parameter here. So let me just clear this and start off fresh. 
So I can say give me output as JSON C, which is color coded JSON output, and I will get uh, the similar output as JSON, but this is much more uh, pleasing, I would say, because we get the uh, values in color coded form and we can find out uh, which is the default version. So each of these versions, they have this default parameter and we can see that currently the default version is 1.15.10. We can also change the output from JSON to another format, which is a table format. And sometimes I prefer the table format because it shows which versions are upgradable from the current version or the upgrade path. So let me rerun that command here. And we can see that we have 1.17 version in preview 17.3. There are no upgrades available for this version, but if you look at 1.14.7, we have 14.8, 15.7, 15.10 as the upgrade parts available. So if you are on 14.7 version, 1.14.7, you can upgrade to any of these higher versions. So now let's go and uh, look at how the portal looks like if we have a look at the same Azure Kubernetes service. So we can go to Azure portal using portal.azure.com. And we can try to create the AKS service here, instance of Azure Kubernetes service. So we can search for Kubernetes service. It. And this will ask me for various options to be provided, like which is the resource group where I want to deploy this particular Azure Kubernetes service. So resource group is a logical collection of your resources. You can tag this to a particular team or a particular department and you can put all the resources for that particular team or the resource or application for that matter into a logical grouping. Next is we need the cluster name and this has to be unique. Uh, then we specify which region where we want to create this particular cluster, Kubernetes version. So you can see that this matches what versions we were seeing in the command line output. And the default, as we saw in the command line, is 1.15.10. Then we have the DNS prefix name, the node size. This is the size of the VMs which will be used for the worker nodes are the client nodes. What is the node count? Default is three. We can override this. Then for the scaling, it has support for virtual nodes and VM scale sets. Uh, by default, the virtual nodes is disabled and VM scale sets is enabled. For authentication, it supports service principle. Uh, there is also the role-based access control or RPEC enabled by default. In terms of networking, we can create a private cluster where this will be deployed within the uh, private networking only within the node pool and it will have the private IP internal IP address. This will not be accessible outside using the public IP. There is the HTTP application routing which allows for easy access for the applications which are deployed and to publicly access those using DNS names. We have the load balancer, there is the network configuration, monitoring, so by default, monitoring support is enabled. We can provide tags and we can click uh, create and review after filling in all this information. This is using the user interface or the portal. I personally uh, don't like this approach. I like to automate things and that's where I use a script, which is a PowerShell script. So you can see the script here in my repository. This is uh, sitting under the PowerShell folder and it's named initialize aks.ps1 for PowerShell script. So let me walk you through this uh, script and explain what it's trying to do. 
So it takes multiple parameters. What I like about PowerShell in this case is I can provide the default values. So I can mark the parameters as whether they are mandatory or not using true or false for mandatory variable or attribute. Then provide the name of the parameter and the value. So by default, I'm using Microsoft Azure sponsorship as the subscription name. I use the resource group name. In this case, I'll be using demo Keda series RG as the resource group name. Resource group location as Southeast Asia. Cluster name as AMQ, uh, AKS MQ cluster. Worker node count, I'm setting it as two. And the Kubernetes version. In this case, I've used 1.11 as the default value, but then uh, in the actual command, I'm not using it currently. So this would uh, be using the default value for the Kubernetes version. So it starts off with setting up the subscription that I use and here I'm using the az account set command and I set the subscription whichever is provided. In this case, it's the Microsoft Azure sponsorship subscription. Once the subscription is set, any of the commands that I run after this point would be run against this subscription. So the next step I do is use the az group create and create a resource group for the resource group name and the location name which is provided in the parameters and I output this as a JSON C the color coded JSON. Once the resource group is successfully created, I use the az aks create command. I specify all these parameters which is resource group name, the cluster name, node count and for this demo purpose I am disabling the role based access control or RPAC. And I output again in the color coded JSON format. Once we have the cluster created, we need to get the credentials for that cluster. And that we get by running the get credentials command using AZAKS. So this one will get the credentials of the cluster, the context of the cluster, the user which is able to connect to the cluster and put it in the cube config file locally on my machine. And the last part which I do is also to create a cluster admin and associate that with a service account so that I can able to access the dashboard of the Kubernetes cluster. So let's go and trigger this PowerShell script. So I'm already into the folder where the main project files are stored. Let me go into the PowerShell folder. Let's list all the contents and we can see that the initialize AKS is here. Let's trigger this particular script. So I'm not overwriting any of the default values here. Whatever is provided as the default parameter values are used. But if I want, I could when calling this initialize AKS. I can uh, pass those parameters and override the default values. So this process, it will take some time. Uh, it will create a service principle. It will provision the cluster with the two nodes, which is the default size I've specified for the worker count. And it will install all the uh, prerequisites required for creating the Kubernetes cluster on those nodes and uh, this could possibly take 10 to 15 minutes to complete. So I will fast forward this once the cluster creation is done and using the magic of video editing, we will see once the final cluster setup is completed, how does it look like? So while the cluster is getting created, let me show you some of the things which we can do with the command line. So let's look at the help command of AZAKS. And here we have the list command to see which are the clusters which are currently available. 
So let's go back. Is the AKS list? And you can see that the cluster is currently being provisioned and uh, it has this node count of two and it's getting created. So if I go back here, it is still running the background processes or the installation steps. Let's go to the kubectl and see what do we have available. So we will be using kubectl to interact with this cluster once it's provisioned. So kubectl, if we do help. So we have various commands under kubectl again for creating, exposing, explain. There is a command related to the config. So let me pick that command. kubectl. Config and help. So this can be used to uh, look at the current context, delete the context, get the list of clusters, and set the current context. So let's use this to find out what are the contexts available currently in my environment. kubectl config get contexts. So there are two contexts available at the moment and both are pointing to the docker desktop version. So I do not have any context pointing to the AKS cluster. Let's look at the clusters which are available. CTL config. Get clusters. And this also shows that we just have a docker desktop cluster and there is no cluster pointing to the AKS. So once this cluster is created as part of that PowerShell script which does the step of getting the credentials for the cluster which is uh, this step here, the details related to this AKS cluster would be added to that particular cube config and we should be able to see the context as well as the cluster name appearing in the view config. So uh, the cluster has been created as you can see here and it's getting the uh, cluster context here and it has successfully created the cluster uh, AKS MQ cluster with 1.11 version and two nodes. I think this is coming from the wrong message and I need to correct this because it's coming from here, Kubernetes version. So I should pick the version of the cluster. It's okay. So now if we go back and run the same command, kubectl config and get the context. You can see uh, AKSMQ cluster has been added as the current context which is highlighted by this asterisk. Apart from the context, let's do CTL on fake get cluster. So get clusters. And we can see that the AKSMQ cluster has been added to this. Now, if I go and uh, run the kubectl command and say uh, get pods, there are no resources found in the default namespace for this cluster. Let's say get nodes. And there are two nodes created for the uh, a case notebook. We can also see CTL get all the resources associated with uh, this particular cluster 
and can say all namespaces. So you can see that by default, all these objects are created and they're already running on the cluster. So under the default namespace and the cube system namespaces, uh, there are various services, there are various pods which are created. So last time when I ran the get pods uh, command and I did not get any output, it was because in the default namespace, I do not have any pod installed or pod running. So if I run the same command, get pods, we first clear this. We run the get pods commands with the namespace as cube system. We will see the pods which are running under the system namespace. So the same amount of information that we see here using the kubectl commands can be uh, seen by accessing the Kubernetes dashboard. So for that, I have another PowerShell script available, which is called the browse AKS. So uh, this script runs the browse related command. So let me just run that. So this will connect to the dashboard of the Kubernetes cluster. And we can see that we have the similar information that we were seeing on the command line, but on the dashboard. So we can look at the nodes. There are two nodes available and we can drill down into the node information as well. So uh, that is uh, end of part one where we provision the AKS cluster and get it ready for our future development and deployment. Uh, if you want to learn about Kubernetes and AKS more, I find this resource quite helpful. It's called 50 days from zero to hero with Kubernetes and uh, it's done by the uh, co-creator of Kubernetes, Brendan Burns. Uh, it has a series of uh, web links as well as very short and precise videos which talk about various details of services like how does the service work, how does the deployment work, uh, how we can do CI/CD with Kubernetes and AKS. It's a wonderful resource to get started and to understand more about AKS. So thank you for watching this video. In case you are interested in connecting with me on any of the social media platform, here are the names where I'm available. My first name and last name is quite unique. So almost on any platform, I'm available with the same name. Uh, I have a blog, which is at handsonarchitect.com. And if you like this video, please hit the like button, share it, and you can subscribe to my channel. Thank you. And here are some of the links which uh, give idea about my past presentations and